All right, on the behalf of KZFR and People Powered Radio, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce a, a lecture that Richard Becker, Western Regional Coordinator for Answer, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. This lecture is going to cover the current situation in the Middle East, and it's going to be tonight, the Peace and Social Justice Center, January 22nd, 7 p.m., and that's at 526 Broadway Street, Chico, California. Uh, during this lecture, Richard's going to discuss the historical underpinnings, present developments, and work towards safety and justice for the people in the region. During this talk, Richard will increase the awareness of the regional condition conditions and help inform required actions in the community. It's my distinct pleasure to actually have uh, Richard Becker on the phone right here for our audience listeners, so I just want to welcome you to the Peace and Social Justice Show, Richard Becker. Thanks very much, Bill. I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I'd like to just start this a little bit. I, I always like to know a little bit about the person. So, Richard, if you could please tell our listeners a bit about uh, yourself and your dedication towards peace in the Middle East. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> uh, I'm with the Answer Coalition, as you said, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism, uh, which was formed in the immediate a- aftermath, actually two days after September 11, 2001. Because those of us who formed it uh, had been involved in in the issues of war and peace and social justice for many years, and we knew, we felt uh, almost immediately that there not only would be a a war in Afghanistan, but that this would become the pretext for a new war, uh, yet another war in Iraq. And we had some some of us, including some people there in Chico, had been active in the uh, in the struggle against the sanctions, which is really a kind of a genocidal blockade of Iraq, where more than a million people died, uh, half of them children under the age of five. And uh, so th- that's where the Answer Coalition was born. And the Answer Coalition organized most of the big anti-war protests across the country in cities like uh, Washington and Los Angeles, San Francisco, and other cities when hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets to oppose the Iraq war in the run-up to the war in 2002 and 2003, and then against the the occupation that took place that followed that. So that's something about the... uh, And the Answer Coalition has always had, from the very beginning, strong participation from the Palestinian community, the Arab-American community, the Muslim community in the United States, uh, as well as people from... uh, uh, many different nationalities, but we've always seen what's going on there as a kind of a whole. Uh, uh, that there were, there were people who urged us, "Oh, don't talk about Palestine and the occupation there. Only focus on Iraq when Iraq was being occupied." And we said, "Well, you know, that's not really realistic because we're talking about one occupation that's been going on really since 1948, and now there's a new occupation 500 miles away in Iraq." Why should we ignore one and focus on the other when, in fact, both occupations grow out of the same cause? And that same cause is really colonialism uh, and imperial domination in this region, which is such a vital region of the world. So that's a little bit about what, what I and the Answer Coalition have been involved in. Personally, my own activism goes back to the uh, civil rights movement and the Vietnam War. And that's when I became active in the 1960s, late 1960s, and have continued on on many different issues. I've been particularly uh, involved in uh, issues regarding the Middle East since 1981. And in 2009, I wrote a book, uh, Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. Empire, which uh, is a book that's a kind of a basic book about the different issues involved in the struggle over Palestine. That's an excellent, excellent summary. Thank, thank you, Richard Becker, for that, for the historical underpinnings. It's a really good time to kind of talk about what some of the present developments and what we can do to work towards safety and justice for the people in the region for both of those conflicts and any others we, you might not have mentioned. The basic cause of the crisis that has engulfed the region, an almost unimaginable crisis, is the intervention, particularly by the United States and its allies in the region, which has sustained the most reactionary governments, like Saudi Arabia, a monarchy which has never had an election. We hear from the government and some of the mass media here in the United States criticism of, say, the election in Iran or an election in Venezuela. But strangely enough, they they very rarely talk about the fact that here's Saudi Arabia, which has been such a profit center for U.S. corporations, the military-industrial corporations, the oil companies, and so forth, has never had an election in its whole history and has ruled over 
by this extremely vicious royal family that's grown very rich as the junior partners of the oil companies and the banks and the military corporations and so forth. So that's who the U.S. has sustained. That's who U.S. policy has sustained. And ever since the decolonization process in all of the Middle East, basically all of the Middle East, or virtually all of it, was, was colonized uh, up until World War II, and since the rise of the decolonization movement, which, of course, swept across uh, Africa and Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America as well, that process is one that the uh, government, whether it's been a Republican administration or a Democratic administration, whether it was the Truman Doctrine or the Eisenhower Doctrine or the Carter Doctrine or what Reagan did or what Clinton did or the Bush Doctrine, uh, has, the U.S. policy has had the aim of destroying the secular nationalist movements, whether they were uh, socialist or communist or uh, neither of those, Baathist, of uh, uh, different ideologies. But any movement and any government which has sought to be independent of outside domination, and particularly of United States domination, because after World War II, the U.S. displaced Britain and France as the main colonizing power, the main intervening power, any of those uh, governments or movements that have sought to have national independence, meaning that the resources of the country should be used for the benefit of the people, not for foreign corporations and foreign interests, uh, have been viewed as enemies and have been targeted for destruction. And that's fundamental. That's fundamental to the region. And really, it's irrefutable that that is, a, that is what we have seen uh, take place. And it's been quite well documented now, much more so than even a few years ago. And so that underlying, that, that kind of dominating and underlying feature of reality, of political reality in the Middle East, uh, has to be recognized and it has to be seen that a continuation of that intervention cannot but produce more of the same. And in recent years, and I would say particularly that the invasion of Iraq which was a colossal uh, disaster, and a colossal actually from the, it, the it was carried out due to the extreme hubris, the prideful arrogance of those who were in power in Washington that they chose to they chose to have a war against a country which in no way threatened the United States. That that led to the destruction of Iraq as a country, essentially. And then the invasion of Yemen, I mean, the, the, uh, the U.S. NATO war against Libya in 2011 led to the destruction of Libya as a country. And now we see Syria torn apart and Yemen torn apart. Uh, and uh, these are all have been carried out by the United States, Britain, France, and their allies, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, for the Turkey, uh, another NATO ally. And it has brought us to a point where now we see terrible organizations that have arisen, like the Islamic State. Almost unbelievable that such a force could dominate large parts of both Syria and Iraq and Libya. But it is a really, truly a product of this outside intervention. Now, Richard, that's a, excellent. I've never really heard it phrased that way and so eloquently. I, I appreciate that, as I'm sure our listeners do. Maybe you could give us some of your insights on how the the government, all these different governments have been able, as specific here to the United States, to convince people that this terror in the Middle East over this past 20 years or so is a direct threat to our country and it's a national security issue and we've got to go over there and bomb and kill people and everyone's rah, 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 like it's World War II again. What's your thoughts on how they've been able to accomplish that? If you look back at what was going on in, truth, in, the, in the summer and fall and winter of 2002 and into 2002, the invasion of Iraq actually began on, on March 19, 2003. But in the months leading up to it, government official after government official, top officials, uh, President Bush, Vice President Cheney, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, and then, of course, echoing them was British Prime Minister Tony Blair. They were on the media constantly, <clears throat> and their message was, let not the smoking gun, that mean, it meant, let not the smoking gun, the proof of Iraq's so-called weapons of mass destruction, be a mushroom cloud. And they all repeated this. They used exactly that phrase, mushroom cloud. 
And, of course, the implication there was that Iraq had nuclear weapons. At one point, Blair said we, they could hit us in 40, in, with no more than 45 minutes warning. In other words, that Iraq could launch, I guess, missiles with nuclear weapons on them and hit London in 45 minutes. So this is repeated over and over and over again. And the other thing that was repeated over and over again was, an, uh, in various different ways, was an attempt to link together, to conflate 9-11, the attack that had taken place, the terrorist attack in New York that had destroyed the World Trade Center, that that was linked to Iraq. And you had officials saying that from the very beginning, inferring that it was all one and the same, that <clears throat> if you didn't want to see another 9-11 you should support the war on Iraq. If you didn't want to see the United States bound with nuclear weapons, you should support the war on Iraq. And over and over and over again. I mean, I have to say that despite that, I don't know if actually a majority of people in the United States even did support the war. I do know that a very large number, millions and millions of people demonstrated against it. Uh, there were more demonstrations in a, in a six-month period mass anti-war demonstrations than any other time in U.S. history, even more so than, even more than in the time of the Vietnam War, than that anti-war movement. But that this was done, and it all was a complete lie. Uh, they, these were just fabrications. And uh, it, it's not a matter that there was faulty intelligence. These were contrived, fabricated stories, lies, that were fed to the people in the United States uh, continually during that period, to justify a war. Now, today, I would say the situation is very, very different than it was then. I think that because of the Iraq War, and I think of the anti-war movement that existed, and I think because of all the costs of those wars, there is very, very little appetite. Anytime any of the politicians that we hear, whether this grotesque band of Republicans who are seeking the nomination, or the Democrats, uh, who have, and, and Clinton in particular, has a good deal of blood on her hands. But whenever they talk, they always have to say, no, no, we're not talking about sending troops, not sending troops, no boots on the ground, and so forth, because there was a revulsion at any kind of a new war in the Middle East, and the, a big majority of people uh, in the United States today are opposed to any such war. But the, a great deal of damage has been done, and a, a, a great part in justifying that to the people of the United States and rallying public opinion was the fabrications, the lies for which those who committed those acts, which are really crimes, uh, should not be living in luxury today like they are. They should be in prison. Yeah, I can agree with that. Just to share a little personal story for me, and it was, uh, I, I can still remember the block I was on, Richard Becker, coming back with my son, who was 10. I'll never forget. He said to me, he says, Dad, what if we invade Iraq and there's no nuclear weapons? There's no weapons of mass destruction. And that just hit me. It's this 10-year-old kid, Richard. And I, I literally yeah. told him from my back, I said, you know what? We have to have faith in our government. I said, so many people have been so adamant that there's, this is true, that we can't expect that our government is lying to us. So you can imagine how I felt very shortly thereafter as a veteran. And I saw it, how it all unfolded. Uh, it was like you said, it's, it's just a complete travesty, and we're still trying to pick up the pieces. So uh, along the lines of picking up the pieces, Richard, what would you tell our listeners about what we could do to work towards safety and justice for the region today, tomorrow, the next month? Well, I think that there has to be an end put to the intervention. The, what the United States is doing today in Syria and Iraq, you know, they, they tell us that's because ISIS is a terrible organization, and ISIS is a terrible organization. I don't have any question about that. I think that they, they deny women any role in society, any rights. They deny anybody who doesn't agree with their, what I consider a very warped version of Islam, and I think most Muslims consider it a very warped version of Islam, that anyone who doesn't agree with them is subject to enslavement or death at their hands. So this is a super reactionary force which has arisen uh, due to the destruction of all those secular forces. So again, we have this, this contradiction, that, that, you know, we, this hypocrisy where we hear the U.S. leaders bemoaning the fact that now there's organizations like this, when in fact it's been U.S. policy which opened the door for their rise. There was no ISIS, there was no al-Qaeda in Iraq before 2003. No one disputes this anymore. They did not exist at all, and ISIS... The Islamic State is an outgrowth, an even more extreme outgrowth of Al-Qaeda. So 
the idea that now dropping, uh, flying 10,000 sorties and dropping bombs on Raqqa, which is the Islamic State capital in Syria or in Mosul or in other areas where they exist, that that will somehow bring peace and justice uh, to the people of the region is, is completely uh, defies reality. I mean, there's, it, it's the only people who can, who can sort this out are the people who are there. The only way that al-Qaeda was at one point defeated in Iraq was when a large part of the Iraqi population, mostly the Sunni Iraqi population in Anbar province, turned against them and defeated them. And that was in 2007 and 2008 and 2009. It was called the, uh, uh, Iraqi, the Sunni Awakening, the Iraqi Awakening. Just to continue to pour weapons in, to bomb, to carry, you know, to have special... I mean, they say that no boots on the ground, but there are boots on the ground. They're there. I mean, the, there's thousands of U.S. troops, and mostly special operations and trainers and so forth. And we're just back in Iraq again. We don't really know the exact number, and later we'll find out probably that it's more than they say, but it could be, uh, it, it's at least 5,000 U.S. troops are, are in the country there. And we don't know how many. I saw an item today saying that U.S. troops took over an air base in Syria. So, you know, we haven't heard anything about U.S. troops in Syria, but there they are. So we don't know completely what's going on, but we do know that the continuation of this intervention, of military intervention, uh, really what needs to happen is that there should be reparations paid to the countries that have been the victims of intervention. That would be justice. That would be real justice to help them uh, rebuild their society. Uh, which have suffered so much destruction. So what I would say is that, you know, we should call for a withdrawal. And I don't mean just a withdrawal from inside Iraq and Syria, but there are U.S. military bases throughout the region, in Turkey, in Jordan. Israel is, in effect, really a giant military, from the Pentagon's point of view, it's a giant military base. It has its own government and so forth, but it's part of the U.S. global uh, military military apparatus. There's U.S. bases you know, all over the, the Persian Gulf region, not in Iran, of course, but in Kuwait and in Bahrain, where uh, the Fifth Fleet is based. Uh, there's U.S. bases in Kenya. There's U.S. bases uh, just blanketing this region at an enormous cost. Uh, the cost is borne, first of all, by the people who have to live under occupation, and no one really I, that I've ever known of in history and enjoys living under occupation or enjoys living near the military bases of a foreign power. We know what that usually brings with it, particularly, you know, for women, abuse of women, abuse of the, of the population. So there's that, and then the cost of it, in terms of what the cost in human lives we've seen, I don't think there's even been an accounting, a real accounting for the number of U.S. personnel wounded in the Iraq and Afghanistan was. I think the diagnoses of traumatic brain injury and PTSD, it's not that I think this, I know this, continue to mount. So as people come in years afterwards whose lives have been shattered to a large degree because of uh, being deployed into wars based on false pretenses. And then there's the financial cost. It's now estimated, I believe, that the Iraq and Afghanistan wars will end up costing at least $4 trillion. That's $4 million, million and immense sums of money that could be used to uh, do a great deal that needs to be done for people here and for people there. But instead, it continues to flow into the coffers of the military-industrial corporations. Yeah, that's an excellent summary of that, because from a reparations uh, standpoint, and then as a journalistic standpoint, Richard Becker, what, what kind of gets my craw is anytime you try to tell the truth, and real truth is the way you described it is right on the money. A lot of these people are joining ISIS because uh, they're going to get paid. It, it's poverty. These people have been bombed into poverty, and they're the, the voices of, of military and the bombers want to make everyone believe this is radical Islam, but they're catching a lot of these guys and interviewing them. They're like, you know, we're just trying to get some money to feed our family, you know, and that whole economic yep. justice issue has really driven this. And it upsets me when that is presented, that realist, that realistic view is presented. The voices of military power make it sound like, you know, it's a weakness that we even would listen to this. You know, what would you say to that? 
Well, definitely. I mean, it's it's the and and that's where you. I think that we have to see the danger in in what's taking place in the present election in the United States. That you know, you have Donald Trump, and a number of people have said Donald Trump is probably right now the leading recruiter of the Islamic for the Islamic State in the world. That there's one individual who's doing more. Uh, to drive people in that direction. to, uh, But uh, that goes for a lot of the, the candidates who are running. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous games that they're playing, very dangerous rhetoric that they're, they're employing. Yeah. And so you have a combination, like in, in many countries, and particularly, you know, there's been a flow of people from predominantly Muslim countries out and into the more advanced developed countries, and that's uh, from poorer countries, and that's true everywhere in the world. I mean, the whole idea that you could have a world of highly developed and wealthy, relatively wealthy countries and poor countries uh, with high unemployment rates, and the people in those poorer countries aren't going to try to get to the richer countries to have a better life. I mean, if you believe that, you know, you can, that you can stop that with a wall, that's just an illusion. So those are factors... And anger is a factor. Money is a factor, as you said, uh, financial incentives. Anger at what the West has done to their countries. Anger at what they view as the imposition of culture that, they, that many people find offensive. But I think, by and large, the fact that the, the old movements that gave so much hope to so many people in the Arab world were crushed, you know, that doesn't mean that people aren't going to fight in some way. They're going to fight, and it, it can turn out to be in through organizations like uh, like the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. And, and this is, these are outcomes that aren't, are highly predictable. So I think that those, the, those are a number of the factors that are involved in this, but I think the U.S. presidential campaign is having the unfortunate effect of making the situation much worse. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I just want to, for listeners that might just be joining, we're listening to Richard Becker, Western Regional Coordinator for Answer, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. And he's going to be in town tonight at the Peace and Justice Center, January 22nd, 7 p.m., 526 Broadway Street, Chico, California. Maybe we can do some closing comments around what this lecture is going to uh, tell all the folks that show up in here, Richard. We would cover much of the ground here in, in some more specifics and also uh, I want to talk, uh, I will talk in the, about the situation uh, in Palestine and the a situation that where it too is often very much misrepresented as its two sides, its ancient, age-old uh, hatreds between people that is the cause of this. And uh, the same way we hear that, you know, the Sunni and Shia have always been fighting each other and and I, all these things, these are not true. These are not accurate depictions of what's going on. It, it really, the struggle that seems intractable in Palestine between the, between the Israelis and the Palestinians you, uh, is often viewed as, well, it's just that. It's just that struggle between peoples. But in reality, it too is a product of the oppression of the Palestinian people is a product of intervention from outside. It's a, it's a, project that created the state of Israel was part, was one of the many colonizing projects that came out of Europe and out of the United States. And down till today, we have the situation where, uh, you know, some people may say we, we have to be even-handed about it, but the reality is, is that Israel is the, probably the fifth most powerful military. It's a powerful modern economy, and the Palestinians don't have really one square foot of, of land that, that is really theirs today. It's all under occupation, even Gaza, where the occupation takes place from outside. So we have to address it, and, and I've been there a number of times. I've seen the workings of a system that even the U.S. ambassador yesterday, Daniel Shapiro, said the law is practiced unequally between the settlers and the Palestinians in the West Bank. And this, of course, drew a furious reaction from the Israeli government. But what he's really saying and what he's really describing is the reality, which is a kind of Jim Crow or apartheid system that exists there. That has to be addressed as well. And I, I think that one encouraging development in recent years is that all over the United States, including, I believe, in Chico, there is activism in solidarity with the Palestinian cause 
uh, and the right of the Palestinian people to have, to have self-determination. So we want to talk about some of the details of, of what's going on there as well. Yeah, certainly, Chico, man. It's the year I was born, Richard Becker, 1960. They've been doing a peace vigil every Saturday afternoon out on the corner here in downtown Chico. And the only thing I would say, you kind of really summarize some things that's near and dear to my heart, Richard, is violence begets violence and peace begets peace. I mean, unless you're talking about peace, you're not going to get there. Right. All right, Richard Becker, right. it's been a real joy, and this has really been my pleasure because I can't make your lecture, so I feel like I got, I got a nice little snippet of what you're going to talk about, and I think Chico's blessed to have you this evening, sir. Well, thank you very much, Billy. I really appreciate it.